Um, we'll start off uh, tonight looking at resolving conflicts. Last week we were looking at forgiveness uh, predominantly. And tonight I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the people um, the people in your life. This is a very important thing that I don't really feel like is talked about too much. So as we kind of start thinking about the people in our life, let's ask a very, very good question, which I would love to hear. So please, please do share your stories. Who has had the most influence in your life today and why? Who in your life has had the most influence and why? One of the most valuable, uh, I guess you could say, tools that the, that the church has is the elderly, which is why it bothers me so badly when, when churches focus all their energy and effort just on the next generation. That's good, but, I mean, you can't just throw away an entire generation or two. So, I mean, I'm hearing Melissa just said about elderly women in her church, and then uh, Rick just said some elderly men as he was going to church. I mean, that's just saying it's like this recurrent theme we need the elderly. They're a very important part. And I think when we look back on this time, our kids are going to be able to say, hey, remember so-and-so, and they're going to be pointing to the elderly people in the church. I think that's a very important uh, part of their growth and development. It's supposed The church is supposed to connect people. So anybody else? Who has had the most influence in life and why? When I was a kid. And I was telling somebody at my mom's funeral, I said, back when I was a kid, I thought that there were old people and there were regular people. And now that I'm getting older, I see that old people are just young people who have gotten older. It's, nothing's changed, it's except for the body, you know. Okay. So let's take a look at the five, uh, the five people you will have in your life, whether you like it or not. And you should have these people in your life. Uh, the first one is uh, from Exodus 33.11. So this is a very important category in your life. It's a very important category in your life. Um, and that would be mentors. I was reading a book. Wow, I made that font small. I thought I, I, thought I went back and made it bigger, but no, I did not. Man, oh man. Hope you guys have excellent eyesight. <laughs> That's got to be smaller than 30. I don't know. Maybe it is. I don't know. Who cares? Um, Pretty standard. Huh? Yeah. I think, that this, I think that that might be 24. I mean, it's pretty small. Anyways, I'm getting off topic here, guys. Uh, mentors. Uh, I was reading a book by a guy named Gordon McDonald. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of him. Uh, he was one of those uh, public speaker kind of pastors that were real popular. Uh, maybe if I could compare him to somebody, he'd be like a Rick Warren of the 80s. Or, um, uh, you know, someone like that, who, like, everybody knew the guy who was, like, a, um, one of those kinds of things. He was kind of a, a rising star of fame. And he, and he wrote this book, and in the book he talked about the way that mentors had been so valuable to him in his younger years. But he stopped having mentors as he got older. And then he had an affair. And... Then his next book that he came out with, he was talking about how he had always said it never happened to me, and it happened to him. And one of the things is that he stopped having mentors as he got older. All these, all these leadership uh, calls I, I listen to and videos I watch and all this and podcasts and all that, they're always like these 60, 70, 80-year-old guys that are still talking about mentors in their life. So I don't want you to think that mentors are something that you outgrow. There's something that you need. You just have to, as you get older, be real careful about who's your mentor because you want somebody who will actually mentor you. Um, you know. And the idea of a mentor is these are people who pour into you. Um, they're, not, uh, they're, they're not dependent on your age. They're people who pour into you, and you will always need people who take time to pour into you. Uh, for me, I think of uh, my friend Gary, who was, you know, doing all this with us, the, the sound panels and all that. Uh, he was one of the first people who taught me anything about guitar. Uh, taught me a lot about the guitar. Taught me a lot about worship. Um, taught me a lot about uh, how to kind of work with your team as a worship team um, to get past, you know, the idea of just simply being a worship leader and into a worship team. It was very, 
very important stuff for uh, for well for a teenage boy that didn't really have a whole lot of uh, friends. Um, but very important, very important. Um, the next one we go to Acts chapter thirteen, uh, verses two through five. And I will tell you in advance, Grace, it's two slides. Would you mind reading them? (laughs) So it mentions here uh, a couple people working together, and they're all kinds of doing different things on the trip, but they're all working together, which brings us to a second very important person that you really have to have in your life, teammates. Nobody can do it alone. Uh, We live in the age of, you know, don't kind of tell me how to live my life, just kind of let me do my own thing. And I think that we are really... um, well, uh, causing problems for ourselves in the future. I don't think that the whole let me live my life on my terms and I'll find my own truth, I don't think is going to give a lasting impact of growth uh, for the next generation. I think that it's really just making a bigger problem. Um, you could say it a different way. No man is an island. The same idea. Uh, the good thing about teammates is it prevents arrogance. This is a very important thing. Um, it's important important when you're young and it's important when you're old. It, it's something that you're always going to be prone to arrogance. You're going to think that you know everything. It's just what we do as people. And having teammates help you to helps you to not do that. And uh, if I could compare it to anybody, I would compare it to the other associate pastor uh, at the church I just left. His name was Chuck. He uh, was a handicapped fellow. And uh, he taught me a lot about how to adapt uh, in times of a medical emergency. <laughs> uh, he had his kidney failure before I ever had my diagnosis. And so he was able to kind of walk me through the process and tell me, you know, what, what I was going to feel and, and think and all these different things. It was very important, and we were able to do stuff t- together. There was times when he would have a project that he wanted to do, but his presentation was a little bit lacking. So I'd make the presentation, and it would be his idea, and we'd kind of present it together. And uh, it, it was a good time. It was, made it where not everybody, not one person had to carry the torch uh, by themselves. Um, and, uh, yeah, so Todd, would you mind reading First Timothy 1 and 1-2 one, for me? So this is, this is one of the most important examples we see. Well, maybe not most important, but one of the uh, most visible, I guess, uh, examples of the student relationship. So this is like the other half of the mentor. These are people that aren't pouring into you, you are pouring into them. Very important to have in your life. Um, I didn't know what to call them, so I just called them students. (laughs) You could call them uh, pupils or I don't know. Um, And the idea here is that it can't die with you. It can't. It cannot die with you. You have to pour into the next. Um, as, As a pastor, they tell you, from the moment that you become a pastor, you start planning for your successor. It's very important. Because if you don't do this, if anything ever happens to you, nobody will know where to go from there. It's very important that you start training up the next people. It's never too early to start looking at the next generation and say, hey, these people are going to take over for us. It can't die with us. We have to let them you know, know the truth, raise them. Deuteronomy goes over and over and over again about how you're supposed to, um, you know, uh, do stuff with your kids and constantly remind them of it and over and over and over again. So very important. Um, and, and, and a really good thing about students is that having somebody that you pour into keeps you looking forward instead of just kind of getting, getting stuck in the problem. It, it, it helps you to keep looking forward, and it also helps you keep looking out where you're considering, you know, hey, how is this going to impact the next generation? You know what I mean? Um, for instance, I, I've talked to some people. I don't really want to get too into it, but I've talked to some people who were considering a divorce, and um, one thing that constantly came up in the conversation was the impact they would have uh, on their children. Um, obviously, you know, they, there were some issues that they needed to deal with, absolutely, but um, you can't ignore the fact Act that kids didn't ask to be brought into this world, so you can't just like throw them as a tailspin. You can't do that. Um, so, uh, so in the in, in an example of a church, this would be like maybe staff, um, or if you're the worship leader, it'd be like the worship team. If you're a family, it'd be like your kids. Um, if you're a business, it'd be like your employees, so on and so forth. Um, you think of it like an electrician 
training the, the, the next electrician. Uh, by the way, do you know what it's called when a plumber has a, um, has a, uh, what's it called? Apprentice. Do you know what it's called when a plumber has an apprentice? It's called being potty trained. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. You done good, Michael. You done good. So Acts fourteen, eleven through twelve and nineteen. Uh Chris, I don't remember if I asked you, do you have a problem with reading out loud? No? Okay, good. Can you read this then? It's I think two two slides. And do it without laughing. So this takes us to the fourth group of people that you will inevitably have in your life, and that's the masses. And uh, don't read this too far into this, but most people in your life are going to be in this category. They, I, I, I always called them the milk suckers, and then I realized as I got older that it doesn't sound too good. The idea is this. You know when you put your cereal in the milk and it just kind of soaks there and just kind of gets all soggy? They just kind of enjoy what you've got going on. They don't really um, detract it or discourage or anything, but they just kind of enjoy it. Um, maybe they go to like um, Joel Osteen's church or something, and they don't do anything to help the church or anything. They just go there and they listen, they enjoy it, and then they go. You know what I mean? Um, they're like cereal and milk. It just kind of sits there. Uh, the masses are great and everything, and they help pastors feel more good about themselves. Look at how many people I got in the church. But they, they don't really, they're not really loyal. They don't really go anywhere with you. They just kind of uh, exist in your life. Um, and everybody, everybody has them in their life. Um, whenever you get a, a really good idea and you're really pumped, and you go to tell somebody, but they just kind of, oh, that's great. And then the conversation just kind of dies there. That would be a mass. <laughs> Uh, when, when you say, hey, I got this idea, and they say, hey, that's great. You're doing a great job. I know you'll get there. That's a mentor. When they say, hey, you got, I got this really great idea, uh, and I would like you to do it. <laughs> that's an apprenticeship. And uh, when you've got a really good idea, and they say, man, that's great. Do you need any help? That's a teammate. Uh, so then let's see. Okay. And then the last one, number 16, 1 through 3. And if we could have Terry come on stage and read this out loud, uh, reciting it from memory. And I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, Terry. Uh, now Korah, son of Itzar, son of Kohath, son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, sons of Levi, and On, son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took 250 prominent Israelite men who were leaders of the community and representatives in the assembly, and they rebelled against Moses. They came together against Moses and Aaron and told them, You have gone too far. Everyone in the entire community is holy, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the Lord's assembly? And that takes us to, unfortunately, the, the, the fifth group of people that you will, will have in your life. It's just, it's a fact of life. These are your opponents. There are opposition. There are people who don't really, um, and they'll never have your back. And that's something you need to accept. That's the fact. There are some people who, they're like Peter, okay? They just give them time, and they're not a Judas. They're, they're a Peter. You just got to give it time. Then there's other people who are Judas, <laughs> and that's just what they're going to do, and you have to accept that there's different people in your life. And the reason why I say this is because sometimes you're going to be faced in a situation, you're going to say, was it my fault or was it not my fault? And it might have been your fault, at least in part. But remember that you are not responsible for other people's reactions. You are responsible for your actions. Very important difference to make, or distinction to make. Um, and the thing about opposition is they will always be against anything that you do. Um, oftentimes they use people, but not, not necessarily. Opposition isn't always manipulators. Now, it's important to remember that um, you're going to want to demonize your opposition, right? You're going to want to only see the worst in them, only attribute the worst. They've got no good qualities. This is a huge mistake. Everybody has good qualities, okay? Uh, I remember I've told you guys stories about some people who were doing some very illegal things. 
they had good qualities, a lot of good qualities. Okay, just because they were doing some bad stuff doesn't mean that they were evil to the core, nothing that they ever did right. Okay, so just kind of getting that out there. Um, and it's important that you recognize these five groups of people in your life and that you kind of respond wisely, I guess you could say. Okay, you don't want to bar your soul to opposition. But you also don't want to entrust your vision to the masses. See what I mean? If you've got a really good idea, your first step should be to go to a mentor and try to get it better. And then take it to teammates and try to get it better. See what I mean? Teammates are, aren't just to help you launch your vision. They're also to help you refine your vision. Very important things. Now, when we're talking about the kinds of people in your life, and obviously it's important that you kind of prioritize your time. You know what I mean? Um, unfortunately, us pastors do this thing almost constantly. We find, let's say you've got 100 people in your church, and let's say 1% to 5% are the opposition, constantly disgruntled. They have a problem with anything you do. Okay? What pastors like to do <laughs> is we like to focus on that 1% to 5% really narrow, zero in on them, and we try, to, we try to make them like us, make them support us, and we get tired and worn out and burnt out because you, you can't. You know what I mean? You can't do that. It's a much better tactic to focus on the 20% that are always with you all the time, and then the masses just kind of go with them. You know what I mean? Masses don't really like, eh, whatever, so they'll just kind of go with the flow. So as you focus on the people that have your back, the others will just kind of hop on. You know what I mean? So uh, whenever you're talking about people in your life, and I want to make this absolutely clear, don't ever reduce people to simply positives or negatives. Are they a positive in my life or a negative in my life? Don't ever do that. It's a huge mistake. First off, that's not how God sees people. Every single person was created special by God and is loved by God, and you have to remember that, even when you're dealing with people you don't like. Second off, remember that it's not just about what can I gain from this person. It's also about how can I serve this person. Well, what if they never change? Well, you don't serve people so they'll change. You serve people because that's what Christ does. You don't serve people for the payoff. You, you do it because that's what we're called to do. See what I mean? And the whole different mindset. And that's something that I never understood when I was in the heat of the battles that I was dealing with. I always thought, man, it was a waste of time. All the, t all the time and energy that I spent in, in, in doing this, they never changed. See, I did it for the wrong reason. I, didn't, I shouldn't have done it so that they would change. I should have done it because I was trying to be like Christ. See what I mean? And so we kind of get our, our perspective off. Just because you can recognize that somebody is opposition and that you shouldn't be spending all of your time with them does not mean that you shouldn't be loving and serving them. And it's very important to remember this. So that takes us to Matthew 5, 46, if this will go. Uh, Darla, do you have a problem with reading? Okay. Yes, absolutely. If you love those who love you, what reward? And the idea here... Uh, and it's something that I learned too late, I think, for a lot of the situations. Thankfully, my life didn't end, so I can use it in the future. I just wish I could have learned it earlier in the past. If I could have learned this as a kid, I think that it would have really helped me uh, deal with some of the situations. Your love is measured by those you love the least. What we do is we say, I'm a loving person, and we look at all the people that we don't have conflict with. All the people that we get along with really easy. And we say, hey, I'm a real loving person. I got this together. But what this passage in Matthew 5.46 says, this is just me rewording it in my own words, is that your love is measured by those who you love the least. Let's go back and read it again. If you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do this. He's saying the exact same thing. Your love is measured by those who love you the least. Now, now that we've said that, though, I need to 
go to the other side of this argument and remind you, but recognize that some, some people in your life pour into you and some people drain out of you. Okay? These are the facts of life. <laughs> You're going to have some people in your office space that are very stressful. You're going to have people in your house and your family that are very stressful. It's one of those things. It's just one of those things. You have to learn how to deal with it because there's going to be those kinds of people. So what I would recommend is that you don't get a, hard, get a bad attitude. You make sure your attitude's always good. That's the first thing. Second thing, I would make sure repent and ask for forgiveness for your wrong. Third thing I would suggest, change. If you start with this idea of they're a toxic person, you're just going to shut off everybody from your life who has anything of value to say. And that's a fact. I know in our culture today, everybody's talking about toxic this and toxic that. If you think they're toxic, they're probably not. Okay, it's probably just they're saying something you don't like. So, uh, definitely prioritize your time. You don't have to only spend all of your time on, on, on people who are disgruntled. Absolutely. But know the difference between somebody being perpetually disgruntled and somebody just having an issue that needs addressed. There's a big difference. Okay? Your kids are going to have a problem with you some parts of the day. You just got to remember that doesn't make them the enemy. Okay, so... Uh, okay, I already said that. Don't spend the same amount of time with everyone. Okay? Give most time to those who are with you, not against you. Okay? This is very important. When you read through the Gospels, Jesus... Talk to the masses, yes. But look how much he gets alone with, with his disciples and just kind of pours into them one-on-one. -on -one. You know what I mean? He was establishing the church for the future. He was telling them the same thing. And he tells them this. He, he tells them this. He says, okay, so I'm going away. And when I've gone, the Holy Spirit is going to remind you all these things that I've been telling you. This is a very important time that's coming. He is, me he is the mentor to the disciples. He's, he's telling this. But he's also their teammate, too. And this is where things get kind of weird in the Bible because think about this. God, God became man and then died for us. He served us. Our mentor served us. When in human society, we, we have our underlings serve us. But that's not how Jesus did things. And so then he, he came and he does this. And then he serves alongside them and makes us co-heirs. That's a crazy thing. It's a crazy thing. In our human understanding, it's like, no way. No way I'm going to trust this screw up with the future of my company. And yet, Jesus looked at us and he didn't see a screw up. He, he poured into us and, and, and gave us everything that we need in Scripture. How amazing is that? Just unreal, just totally unreal. Nothing like this has ever been done by people. And it's important, though, as you are, you know, separating your time with, you know, in kind of ca categorizing your time. It's incredibly important that you never get to the stage of surrounding yourself with yes men. Very important that you never do that. You don't need a whole bunch of people saying how great you are. You don't need a bunch of people telling you about how you don't need to change. How many people have had people say, oh no, girlfriend, it's totally his fault. We don't, we don't need that in our lives. <laughs> we... We don't need a bunch of yes men. Um, yeah. And I found this. I found that you will either f have people in your life who help you to be humble or God will put you in humbling situations. One or the other. <laughs> One or the other. So uh, then, unfortunately, there are some people who you have to avoid. You cannot be united with them. You do have to avoid them. And we're going to go through a series of scriptures, so I'm going to read them just so, you know, I don't want to overburden people with all these different verses, because uh, there's going to be quite a few of them. The first one, St. Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, hard times will come in the last days. So when are the last days? Right now. They came to. They came as soon as Jesus died and was resurrected. Right? Okay, so hard times will come in the last days. These are those days. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, pri uh, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanders without self... You know what it means to be irre irreconcilable? It means that you cannot be reconciled with other people. You've got a chip on your shoulder, and that's the way it's going to be. You know what I mean? So, 
uh, disobedient to parents. Look at the list that he makes here. Um, unholy, unloving, slanderers without self-control, brutal without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the form of godliness but denying its power. Avoid these people. And then in Matthew seven fifteen, be on your guard against false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravaging wolves. Second Thessalonians 3, 6, Now we command you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from every brother or sister who is idle and does not live according to the tradition received from us. First Timothy 5, 8, But if anyone does not provide for his own family, especially for his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Remember here, he is not talking about people in the world. He's talking about Christians. Okay? So what we do is we, we, we see people like this living in the world and oh, oh, they're already condemned because they, they haven't surrendered their life to Christ. They're not condemned because they're living sinfully. They're condemned because they're not submitted to Christ. So you know, we don't have to, co- have to uh, condemn them again. <laughs> Paul actually says that we're not to condemn the world. That's Jesus' job. We're supposed to judge ourselves. So it's very important here. Um, yeah, absolutely very important. Christians, as they grow, should reach the point of being able to provide for their household. Very important. Um, very, very important. The, the culture is going to tell us this is what men have to be. They have to be passive. They, they can't be protectors. Actually, a woman can be a man nowadays. All these different things that, that our culture says this is a man. And the Bible says, okay, well, anyways, so this is actually what a man is. And one of the things that God has called men to, men to be is protectors who sacrifice their own good for the good of their family. That is a difficult uh, concept, but it's exactly the image that Jesus has given us. See, men are naturally geared to protect. That's just in their nature. But not so much to protect to the point of death. Um, it can be conjured in them. My point being, men are naturally very self-serving. So they're going to be more focused on, you know, uh, sexual things, you know, because that's that feels good. And the whole dying thing, that doesn't really feel good. But men definitely have the body to be able to withgo, with, with, uh, undergo um, pain. So Titus 3, 9 through 11 says, But avoid foolish debates, genealogies, quarrels, and disputes about the law, because they are unprofitable. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't really tie that in. My point being, and what all that I said just about being a man, is as we grow in the faith, we're supposed to grow as men into the men that God has designed us to be. Sorry about that. Did not mean to just leave that thought out there. Now going on to Titus 3, 9 through 11. But avoid foolish debates, genealogies, quarrels, and disputes about the law because they are unprofitable. They're worthless. Reject a divisive person after first or in second warning. For you know that such a person has gone away and is sinning. He is self-condemned. So these are all examples of people that were told you actually have to avoid there are there's this, there, there is not going to be a situation where you, where you get to in your life where you will be able to resolve every conflict. And that's kind of my next thought here. You cannot resolve every conflict. Stay away from problem makers in the church or people who left the church after causing a big fuss. People, uh, people who want to grow, they will grow. You find this over and over again. People who want to grow, they're going to grow. You don't have to beg them to grow or they're going to grow. Otherwise, you spend your whole time catering to those who will leave disgruntled anyways. You don't know how many times I've seen pastors do this, and I've done it myself too, where you make your whole ministry trying to appease the unappeasable, and five years down the road, they leave anyways. And you missed valuable opportunities with those people who wanted to hear about Christ. It's very important because you don't have unlimited time. You, you do have a limited window. Um, I mean, think about your kids. It was just yesterday that they were smearing their hands on the windows in your house. And now your house is nice, has nice and clean windows, but the kids are gone. See, I mean, I was watching a video. Somebody shared this on Facebook, I think. And it really, it really got to me because that's true. I mean, we, we try and think that these things are really super important. Oh, my house has to be clean. My windows have to be clean. My dishes have to be washed. And the whole time we're missing valuable opportunity with our kids because we're fighting about stupid stuff. And uh, it's, it's kind of it kind of goes right along with that. 
Um, so, you, you, you really can't restore those who won't repent, though. And this is a very important distinction. Sometimes we want to restore people when they haven't had a chance to repent. And you can't restore them because the sin is still there. So, we'll go through a couple more verses here, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, Maria, do you read or no? That's fine. Gracie, do you do or no? Yeah? Okay, go ahead. So this is actually where we started nine, month, nine weeks ago. Uh, resolving conflict starts with you, which brings us to a very important idea. You cannot resolve if you are the cause. Very important that we're always growing. Luke 6, 30, 32. This is a long one. Uh, Sandy, do you read or no? You do? Is it going to be a long one? Are you good with that? Okay. The idea of... Definitely self-evaluation. Search your heart. Search your feelings, Luke. You know it to be true. No, but seriously, uh, uh, search your heart. It's one of those things where you have to allow yourself to the idea that you might not be perfect. You might not be perfect. Once you come to that realization, it's all downhill. Oh, boy. You start realizing how much you need to grow. Uh, John Bevere, I was watching a video... It was an amazing video. He was, I don't actually really like John Bevere, but it was a really good video. He was talking about the way that he started having this really bad um, uh, attitude. He was just bitter all the time. He was upset all the time. He's like, God, what's the deal? I wasn't even acting like this before I was saved. What happened? Why am, why am I in this situation? And, uh, and uh, I don't know if it was God or, or, or whatever, but somehow or another, it, the, the image kind of popped up into his head about the ring that he was wearing. Uh, it was a 10, 14 karat gold, which means, which I did not know this. Okay, I'm telling you because this is something I learned, and it is important to the story. I'm not just telling you random facts. Uh, that means that out of the 24 carats of the whole, 14 parts of it is gold, and 10 parts of it is uh, basically filler, uh, waste material. And if you put that in the fire, it'll melt down and the filler will come to the top and the gold will go to the bottom. I did not know that gold was heavy. Evidently, it's heavier than the drosses. Who knew? One other thing I didn't know. So the idea being here that it was there in the ring the whole time. He just didn't know it. But if you put it in the fire, it all comes to the surface. See, sometimes we think we're doing real good, and God just kind of has a way of taking us into the fire to show us all these things that were there the whole time. We just don't see them because, especially, we live in a culture where it's very, very much so, you are perfect just the way you are. You don't need to change. Love yourself and all this different stuff, which is, I mean, that's whatever, but I mean... It's telling us these things that just aren't true. And uh, so we do have to search our heart. Give the grace that you want. That's always a good rule of thumb. It says that Jesus came in grace and truth. It mentions grace first before truth. And I think that that's an important distinction to make. Grace has to be dominant. And uh, so the idea here being that you shouldn't be a critical person. And I'll read the last passage. Uh, it's in Mark. And I don't know why I didn't write it there. It's supposed to say Mark 10.45, but yeah. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And that kind of just shows us uh, how, how we are really supposed to do our ministry in our life.